fall asleep, and I don't really blame you because the conversation is quite tiresome. Especially after like 7.30, you begin to wander off and think about food and husbands and wives and children. If you're old, think about sickness and death. You know, like all things of value, kind of like the story of the prodigal son, it's very difficult to understand, appreciate, uh, to some extent, revere and honor some of the ideas presented in any of the great traditions, whether philosophical, religious, political, social, because it really takes a long, long time for someone to sit, to go through life, to be pushed into reflection and examination, to deal with the regret, the remorse, and all the pain caused really by one's action and one's lack of reflectiveness. And then you kind of sit and try to figure things out, and it's a a lot of things that you have to plow through. Uh, You know, it's kind of like when someone says state sale, and you drive by the house, and you look at the woman and the man who owns the house, who own the house, and all the stuff in the garage or parking lot. And it's an accumulation of 40, 50, 60 years of a life that, for some strange reason, they have a tendency of going to Rawls or Home Goods or Home Depot and just buying stuff over the years. And one morning, the wife looks at the husband, the husband looks at the wife and says, we just got too much junk. Initially, you just talk about it, but uh, you're still very much attached to all the junk you have around the house, and you don't mind bumping your knees or your shoulders to, you know, the stuff around. But one morning, and no one knows how this happens, really. The wife wakes up at 3 in the morning and makes a lot of noise. The husband goes out and says, what the heck are you doing? I'm tired. I need, I need my freedom. Freedom from what? I just need the house to be completely empty. And so the husband really just needed some motivation. So around four, after having a cup of coffee and some bagels or donuts, they go at it. And by nine o'clock, everything that they had accumulated for the past 40 years find themselves in the garage or the parking lot. And everybody comes and some stuff are bought, the rest are just given away freely. And I think that's what happens to all of us. You accumulate. Yeah, I suppose in our case, we accumulate assumptions or ideas, passions and desires, uh, various narratives that we assume will take us to a place called happiness or something that be- will beautify our lives. And after 20, 30, 40, 50 years of going up and down, traveling here and there, we come to realize that, you know, we don't have anything. Uh, we have lied to ourselves, our parents have lied to us, educators have lied to us, politicians, social reformers, all the books, all the ideas that betrayed and deceived us. And now we stand completely naked before life and we have no idea what to do. So let's approach Hinduism that way tonight. Uh, Let's walk away from abstract ideas or concepts and make things a bit more personal. I hope you don't mind. Do you have any questions or comments before we begin? Let's go back to the age is from five to about 20, I suppose, Uh, or maybe 18 or 19, before society imposes upon you all the responsibilities of an absurd and ridiculous life. So what do five-year-olds want really in life? They just want to have fun. What do 10-year-olds want? They want to have fun. What do 18-year-olds want? They just want to have fun. And it comes in a variety of different ways, you know. Some people have fun by playing video games. Some people have fun by going bike riding. Some people have fun at the age of 12 or 13 by smoking or drinking or, you know, enjoying their physical bodies with other physical bodies. That's how it is. And um, you know, it's what we call the stage of karma, pleasure, desires. There is nothing wrong with it. It's natural for all of us. 
You know, I think the idea that you have in the Gospels that you can't make the grass grow by pulling it is very true. You can't make an 18-year-old, you can't force an 18-year-old to understand the big and lofty ideas of religion uh, or politics or some of the social values because they have really been taken hundreds of years to kind of develop. And so an 18-year-old doesn't want a responsible life. An 18-year-old doesn't really want to reflect or think, except where the next drink is going to come from or the, where the next money is going to come from so they can smoke it away. That's what 18-year-olds want to do, you know. And then the tragedy of being 18 or 19 or 20 is that, you know, we are condemned by our own psychology for some strange reason. I don't know how it happens or why it happens. Uh, you maybe it has nothing to do with your age really maybe it happens to you at the age of 25 or 26 or maybe 30 or 40 one day you wake up and you say I just can't smoke anymore you know when you have cancer and you go through radiation coffee doesn't taste the same anymore food doesn't taste the same anymore everything tastes like metal and you don't want to eat anymore because they make you throw up and there comes a point I suppose in your own psychological growth or maturity that you know, you just don't want to have sex without meaning. You don't want to smoke anymore. You don't want to drink anymore. You don't want to party with your friends anymore. Something happens to you where you look yourself in the mirror and you're disgusted. You don't know why, really, but you get disgusted. It's like the age of karma has been coming to an end for you for a while. And for the first time, you realize it is really a facticity. It's something that stands before you as a fact of your own evolution. You can no longer have fun. For some strange reason, your own psychology, perhaps your parents, perhaps society, are imposing what we call adulthood upon you. So you go to school. You get rid of your friends. You become a bit more responsible. You begin to think about your future. You still don't have a very clear idea, but your guides live in society. They are your siblings who are a bit older. They are your parents. They are your aunts and uncles. They are your friends whom you categorize as successful. Those who have gone to school, they have degrees, they have a job, nine to five. They come home, they do gardening, they vacuum, they do laundry, they do vacuuming, you see. And there comes a point where you realize that, well, this is what you really want to do. Your pleasure has changed now. You have grown up slightly. You no longer want to smoke or drink or just have casual sex. Okay. So you put yourself to school. You get a job nine to five. And your skin is now thick. You don't whine. Okay. You're able to endure being at work from nine to five at a cubicle, at a job that disgusts you. And yet it makes you money. It pays for your car. It pays for your food. It pays for your parents' medicine. You see. You're a bit more responsible now. And as the world of karma had meaning for you, all of a sudden it ceases to give you any meaning, any psychological, intellectual, physical nourishments. So you move on to Artha, a place of power, where there is more stability to your life. And like all things in life, it's not meant to last. You know? And again, I don't really know how it happens. For someone, I suppose, like you, Hefner, it never ended. He had the power to be around very, very attractive women, very powerful people. And he continued to be forgetful, I suppose. That stage where you kind of sit and reflect as to what is it that I am doing? I am close to 90, almost a corpse, dead. I should be going to Costco looking for coffins, yet I go to bars looking for attractive women. That stage for him never came about. And there is nothing wrong with that. You know, it doesn't happen to all of us. Okay, go back to what we talked about last night about reincarnation. Maybe people have to come back to life over and over and over again, experience karma or the life of physical pleasure plenty of times before. When they come back to life again, they say, no more physical pleasure. I want a life that's a bit more responsible, a bit more committed, a bit more, that has more depth at the UC. Last week, I went to Roseville and I bought a plant. It was a one gallon, you know, this shrub. 
I put it in the ground, and this morning I realized it's just not the right place. Took the shovel to it, and it came right out. It comes out because it doesn't have roots. But I've had to wrestle with plants that I put in the ground that been there for like five or six years, and it's really, really difficult to dig them out. And so after many lifetimes, I suppose, you find yourself in the world of Artha, a bit more responsible, a bit more committed, a bit more a substance. The roots go a bit deeper, do you see? You begin to value, I suppose you go on to school, you begin to value what we call money because now you begin to spend it on things that will give you physical and emotional stability. And all of us have had those moments. Until one day you you look yourself in the mirror and you say, I have a nice Tesla, I have a nice big house, I have a PhD, but for some strange reason I am not entirely happy. I don't know why. Go back to our conversation about Kafka, about being condemned, that something about you just kind of gets out of you and handcuffs you. And you scream and you shout, what have I done? My body wants pleasure, I gave it pleasure. Why am I feeling guilty? My body wanted sex, I gave it to it. Why do I feel shame? I went to school, I have all these degrees. Why do I feel empty and worthless? Right? That as a human being, you have no choice but to feel condemnation. Sometimes from the outside for sure, but certainly from the inside. Then you look around you and your definition of success, you realize, has once again changed. You know, um, we know you're 17, your brother is going to a college or a four-year school, and we say, I want to do what he's doing. I want to go to a four-year school. And then you do. And then your brother gets married, but you're single, but you have your degrees, and you have a house, and you have your cars. And then you look at your brother and say, I want that. I want to be married. And that's the stage of Dharma, you see. Hello, Fee. And like all of us in this classroom, we go through that stage. You're tired of being alone, you're tired of spending money on yourself, you're tired of looking yourself in the mirror and talking to yourself like a mad person, you know, you're tired of just living a relatively secluded, isolated life. And you say, I don't want to be in a casual relationship anymore, I want commitment, I am ready for that. You know, it's like when you're 18, you just want sex, but you don't want meaning, you don't want to be committed, it's very responsible, there's lots of fun in it. And there comes a point where you say, no, 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 I don't want that. I want sex but has meaning. I want to go out with someone. I want to take them out after whatever it is that we do. I want to go for a walk. I want to have dinner. I want to watch TV. Then there comes a point where you say, well, that's all fine, but I want to be committed now. I want to get married. And that's the stage of Dharma, do you see? You want bona fide relationship with other people. And again, the tragedy. Those of you in this class who are looking for social equality, it'll never, ever, ever happen. Justice is nowhere to be found. Why? Because a 60-year-old will always look down on an 18-year-old and realize the 18-year-old is wasting away, pursuing ridiculous things. And no matter how much you speak to an 18-year-old, they are deaf, dumb, and blind. Remember, youth is always wasted on the young. Do you see? Evolution happens organically. The scientific revolution in the West happened organically. The dam breaks when there are small cracks. Then the cracks become bigger and bigger. Then, then the droplets become streams of water gushing out and then it collapses. Okay? And you have to understand, we spend 
so much of our time and energy and resources pursuing whatever it is that you pursue at whatever stage you exist. Whether it's karma or artha or dharma. You do get married. And you're a great wife. You're a great husband. And you do have children. You know, if you're a woman, it happens organically, your body screams, you have, if you're a man, well, there's a good amount of fear. You keep delaying, but eventually you're forced to have them. Maybe sometimes you just want to have them. It doesn't mean you're ready for any of this stuff, but you move into the stage. And you're responsible, committed to your companion. You try to do the best you can to maintain a relatively healthy and clean relationship. And again, I don't know how it happens or why it happens. You wake up in bed one morning at two or three. You, you look at your life. Your life is great. Your companion is good to you. You're good to him or her. You have great kids. They go to private school. There is nothing wrong with them. But something about you feels miserable. Your sense of self has changed. You know, you had a sense of self in the stage of pleasure. But for some strange reason, you can't find yourself in drink anymore. You can't find a healthy self in smoking anymore. You laugh with your friends, but deep down you know you're just faking it. You're really not happy anymore at the stage of karma. That's not who you are anymore. So you go to school, and it's a huge adjustment. There's a great loss. Because you've been addicted, habituated, in just being slothful. Reflectively, emotionally, sitting in these chairs for two, three hours, where you could be home, and you have been home for 20 years, sitting, watching TV, smoking, just laughing, silly with your friends. For the first time, you take yourself seriously. And it's a different way of looking at yourself. You judge yourself differently. You feel about yourself differently. You condemn yourself differently. You have moved into a different stage in life. Okay? You take your school very, very seriously. And then there comes a point where you look at your degrees, it, don't mean, it doesn't mean anything. You don't see yourself in this paper, in the diploma, but you see yourself in marriage. It gives you meaning. Being called a father, a mother, a husband, a wife, they are meaningful. But there comes a point, as Thoreau would say, that you experience a life of quiet desperation. Or if you read the Gospel of Mark, the very last few lines in the book where they go to see whether or not Jesus is in fact in the tomb and Jesus appears to the three women and says to them why do you seek the living amongst the dead let the dead bury the dead it's something you'll find in T.S. Eliot's work that people have died long long time ago they're just waiting for their actual death. They're like me. They go to class. They give lectures on Hinduism, a lecture they've been given for 30 years. It's no longer exciting for me. It doesn't inspire me. It has no meaning for me. It's a money-making machine for me now. I may be animated to you. I may be screaming or shouting, but do not be deceived by my exterior. Deep down, I feel nothing about these ideas. They don't move me. They don't excite me. This is a stage. And like Kierkegaard, when this class is over, I will sit in my car, I will drive home, and I will reflect on this class and find it meaningless and a waste of time. And though some of you in this class may even find this class to be inspirational, the truth is, Time will steal that inspiration away. You will go back to being forgetful. Your age will creep upon you. You will realize you have a knee ache. You have to work to make rent. You will forget. 
your inspiration stands no chance of survival against all the forces imposed upon you by life, by politics, by society, by responsibilities, by commitments, by age. Do you see the wisdom of Hinduism? <clears throat> People need to engage in physical pleasure. There is no choice. People eventually be get expelled from the world of pleasure, and there is no choice in that expulsion either. It will either happen through external forces or internal forces. You will get out. And you won't judge yourself compassionately. You will be extremely harsh. You will be thrown in the world of responsibility. There is no choice in that. You will have to go to school. If not Laney College, Yale, or Oxford, life will teach you the hard way. And that's our thought. And there will come a point where you will no longer be able to survive casual relationships. You want stability. From the dawn of civilization, ever since we landed on this planet completely naked, what we have always desired was stability. Look around you. It has taken us many, many thousands of years to learn the art of architecture, for buildings to stand still that can house our flesh, to give us comfort, to give us peace. We have done whatever we possibly could to make sure that our future is predictable. That you will go home. No one's gonna evict you from your place. Why? You pay rent. It took us thousands of years to come up with a legal plan where powerful people can just get rid of you. That's called stability. Your future being predictable, therefore it gives you power. And then, the ultimate miserable place where you and I find ourselves is that you have certainly matured. Your pleasures are different now. Your sense of self is different now. The meaning you give to your life is different now. You're a husband and a wife, a father or a mother, or a son who's dutiful to the parents. But then one day you look yourself in the mirror and you say, I am unhappy. Every time you move from one stage to another, go back to our conversation last night, you will go through a call, something about you whispers and says, you no longer belong here, move on. You're pursuing the same thing called beauty, but now you want it in a different container. So you search for it. You search for answers in the old world, but not to be found. So you go to a world you have never experienced. Okay. And there is struggle in finding answers, in making sure you are comfortable in the new world, body, mind, and soul. And then there's a breakthrough. One day you say, I am okay with being in the classroom for about five hours. Okay. Hi. Hi. I'm a student of yours. Please.
Maya. Mia. Mimi. Momo. So, uh, most of us survive the three stages relatively well. Before we move on to the fourth stage in Hinduism, let me talk about uh, a set of paintings that came my way some about 30 years ago. Uh, it's a painting, set of paintings by a man named Thomas Cole. They're called the voyage of life. <clears throat> and to some extent, it's an expression of all of us, really, in this class. No one is exempt from any of the four paintings. But the last painting, really, for the most part, is reserved for people who are slightly aging and a bit more feeble. Uh, but you could also look at the last painting as metaphoric. And we'll talk about that in a minute. So the first painting is called Birth or childhood. So what you have is this raft or a tiny boat that is coming out of this cave. You try to look inside the cave, but it's dark. You can't see anything. You see, the infant on the boat is completely naked. You go back to our conversation about Enkidu. There comes a point in your life where your sense of self does not exist. You have no shame. You have no guilt. You are innocent. Life hasn't yet touched you. You're not yet grounded or walking. You're not contaminated by the adult social world. You are an infant. You belong to a world that has been lost to the adults, you see. And there is an angel on the bo boat. And when you look inside the boat, it's lush, it's green. And you look at the water, it's calm. You look at the sky, it's cloudy. But infants don't care. You look at the rocky environment above the cave, there is not a single thing that's alive. There is this dead tree, and the branches are broke. The sky is cloudy, it's dark, it's bleak. But the infant is happy. The water is calm. Now, many of us in this class don't, remembers our, don't remember our infancy. The only thing that you and I remember is our laughter, which are, for the most part, burdened by the weight of life. Friedrich Nietzsche once remarked that life is brutal, and it's in its brutality there are only two things you can do. You can either cry or you can laugh. And you laugh not because it's funny. You laugh because you're a good satirist. You make fun of life. You make fun of the tragedies of life. Or you cry. Next time you find yourself in a relationship having gone bad with anything, if you pay attention to your crying, you realize there's a good amount of laughter in it. You laugh because you're stupid. And you're stupid because you're a human being. And there is no way out of it. When you read the dialogues of Plato, did you know that there is no single place where Socrates laughs a belly laugh? You read the four Gospels in the, in the New Testament, there is no single Gospel you will find where Jesus laughs. You know why? There is nothing in life that's funny. attention to the reasons you come to this class for a grade, for
for a future unknown to you. Time whose value you just don't know. These are all funny things. To cope, to survive a relationship you don't want to be in. It's a funny issue. And yet there isn't much we can do about it. The second painting. is called Youth. All of you in this class, when you were an infant, you were unaware of all the miseries that exist in life. You laugh. And then comes the arrogance of youthfulness. You look at us older folks and you say, ah, they look so tired, so exhausted. They're walking around aimlessly. I'm not going to be like that. My life is going to be very different. And that's the nature of the second painting. This young man has kicked out the angel off of the boat, saying, I can live life on my own. I can figure things out on my own. Many of you move out of your parents' house at the age of 18. Some of it is cultural, of course. You've been deceived into thinking that just because you're 18 and an adult, no one ever sits you down to tell you becoming an adult doesn't mean that you are one at the age of 18. Hugh Hefner never made it to adulthood. Donald Trump never made it to adulthood. Becoming an adult and being 25, they are two different things. But the point is hubris. The seven deadly sins given to us by Christians. Pride. You sit here assuming that you will understand what Hinduism is talking about. That what these four paintings are about, you will never ever understand. You're not there yet. You raise your hand, you want to ask a question, assuming you understand the words you're using in the questions you're asking. You raise your hand giving a comment, assuming that you know what the hell you're talking about. And what this young kid on this boat doesn't see is that the water is no longer as calm as it once was during infancy. The path that the river is taking is no longer straight. There are lots of windings around it, you see. But the young man doesn't see that. Every young person assumes that they have enough resources, intelligence, wisdom to overcome all the hurdles, obstacles of life. You won't. Life will drag you. It will beat you. It will get you depressed, angry, and violent. And this is America. Violence is prized. Then comes a third painting. Now, let me go back to the second painting and just give you a couple more images. You see, the young man has his fist clinched like this. And he has one leg ahead. And if you look, there is a Taj Mahal. There is like this paradise in the sky somewhere. And the assumption is, I know where I'm going. I know what I'm doing. I know how to get to paradise. Some of you are 18, 19, and you're in a relationship. And you think you have the resources, the insight and the wisdom to make it work. That's your paradise. You won't be able to. Because from where he is and where the paradise is, there is the sand. It's called the desert. He doesn't see the desert. He just hopes. If you want to know why you are happy, why you are casual, 
it's because you have hope. In hope, you don't see the obstacles. 